Hello and welcome to Bajaj Exam Prep IS. As part of a comprehensive news analysis, today we'll be discussing six very important articles out of the Hindu newspaper, Daily Edition. Before we begin, a happy International Yoga Day to everybody. Now, the topics which we are going to cover are quite interesting for GS Paper Three itself. So, good morning to all of you. Semiconductors, fabrication, in India, a very important issue with regards to the future itself. Thereafter. the coal india and the competition commission of india tussle which is going on again brings up a lot of interesting terms which are important for the examination and thereafter upi and a very beautiful article with a lot of data but that data is quite telling with regards to upi itself thereafter we'll discuss about the first mrna vaccine which has been specifically developed for omicron thereafter china you again doing what it has been doing in the un blocking terrorists and last but not the least we'll talk about the yoga day as it is international yoga day today itself and further we'll also talk about trifed trying to push tribal culture into that zone so six very simple but straight forward articles these three are oriented towards mains and prelims both this is more towards prelims as i said standard protocol is going to be that we will go through the basic points of the article first then we will go into the details and then we will summarize in the same session itself we'll summarize two to three times so that we revise in the same session itself so good morning to all of you happy international yoga day to you and now we can begin our analysis for today which is semiconductor fabrication and as i said basic points i will tell you first and then we'll go into the nitty gritty now what does this article talk about see semiconductors are the most important resource as of right now we use chips in everything from cars to very small standard games itself everything has a chip nowadays and therefore semiconductors and semiconductor manufacturing has become a very valuable concept vis-a-vis -vis manufacturing when it comes to the industrial sector but semiconductor manufacturing is also problematic because it is a very expensive concept and therefore because technology changes it is also a very major risk which a manufacturer takes because it may take time to get the money back but by the time you get the money back maybe the technology itself is obsolete so semiconductor manufacturing china south korea the biggest two in that regard but india is trying to push for it india has already missed that train but india is pushing for semiconductor manufacturing in india therefore now let's try to understand what are the basic contours of it what are the risks and where can we learn from china with regards to how india can become a semi semiconductor manufacturing hub because we have a 2022 semiconductors mission but it is not pushing through and since 2007 we have been trying to push different aspects related to semiconductors there was a 2020 2012 breakthrough also however that did not materialize so when first let's try to understand what are the basic chips which can be produced there are three types of chips which are produced one is called a logic board or a logic chip which is logic based semiconductor this is the proper this is the brain of any device these are called basically logic boards motherboards these are called logic boards on the other hand you have what are called memory boards these are very standard you use it in your computer ram rom the basic ssds these are memory boards on the other hand last but not the least is called an analog board analog board memory board logic board are three types of boards which are there logic is the most expensive the most difficult and needs a lot of technological intervention but has the highest margin so it is expensive but the most profitable memory is important as much as analog analog is the cheapest but has no margin itself and therefore if we go towards memory or analog we will be able to fabricate it in india but and with less resources also but the output is nothing wherein you will never be able to get a proper profit and therefore they will automatically start to become loss producing companies itself on the other hand logic needs the most amount of investment it needs the most amount of technology and design also but the output gives you uh, uh, what the input gives you a very good output in the sense that it is very profitable now india has been leaning towards logic boards but logic boards the level of investment is quite big and therefore we need to see how we can how we can 
manufacture it in India without using up a, a lot of resources over and above that, making sure that within the next five years, they don't become loss producing companies itself. So the first point is, and it's very well explained in the article itself, logic, memory, analog, logic boards, memory and analog. Memory and analog can be produced, easier to produce, no margin. Logic is the one where you have a margin, but the most expensive to produce in that regard. Now, what are the risks? What are the risks? See, China and South Korea have rare earth metals, which they need also for producing chips, but South Korea mostly imports it. But they have the technological know-how and the R&D to produce these chips at a very small scale at 4 nm nanometers or even 3 nanometers. We are seeing chips and processors in that regard. Now the risk are three. First, that by the time you put in the money, you put in the investment, you put up the infrastructure, you are also able to produce the requisite technology. However, by that time, for example, you put in $5 billion in this. You put in $5 billion in this. However, by the time you are able to set up this plant, this technology itself becomes obsolete. So the problem is that every year new things are happening, new technological developments are there. And therefore, maybe you need a five year period to develop all of this. And by the fifth year, the technology is obsolete. All this $5 billion is useless. This is the first risk. Second risk is that even if you're able to go through the investment investment technology story, the volume needs to be quite high in the sense that if you are only producing for domestic market, you will never be able to actually get anything out of this company or this subsidiary because it is about producing for the world market, for the global market and volume needs to be extremely high. So your production capacity also needs to be very, very high. And third is that it needs a lot of what we call as technological interventions. To produce chipsets, you need a proper source of fresh water and that to clean water because water is used as an agent whilst making these chips itself. And all of this comes at a cost. And is that cost justified vis-a-vis -vis how much we are producing in India. So water is already a scarce resource in across India itself and putting it into fabrication, what are called fab industries, fabrication industries is basically water not used in the right way itself. So therefore, there is one issue of obsolete technology. There's a second issue of volume. And the third issue is that you put in the technological interventions, you put in the water resources, you put in everything. But if the quality is poor, how, whatever be your volume, if the quality is poor, it will not work. Because in logic boards, the risks are even higher. Memory boards and analog, you can work with it, but there is no basic incentive of going that way itself. So when we talk about, when we talk about the risks, first is logic, memory, analog. Logic is the way India wants to go. Three basic problems are there. First is technology can become obsolete by the time you actually produce it. Second is because the margins are there, but the volume has to be based on global market. It cannot be that you're producing only for India. You have to produce for the world because if you don't produce at that volume, wherein you are producing at least one lakh, two lakh, five lakh chips in a year, then you are not getting your money back itself. See, at the end of the day, it is about getting the input for output. And if the output is not there and it's a loss producing company, then it makes no sense. And last but not the least is everything which goes into it has a cost. And does it justify the cost and rather we should import itself. So there are three basic risks and three basic points which have been made here. Are these first six points clear? If they are, then we'll talk about the next set of issues. How can we learn from the China experience itself? It's all about profit. Yes, Kirti.
ओके परफेक्ट नाउ दी सेकेंड एस्पेक्ट वेर इन दी आर्टिकल गिव यू सोल्यूशन एंड दिस सोल्यूशन विच द आर्टिकल गिव यू इज दैट रैदर देन गोइंग फ्रॉम स्क्रैच इंडिया शुड एक्वायर लॉस प्रोड्यूसिंग फैब्रिकेशन यूनिट्स एंड वी कैन देन पुश इन द मनी दैट गिवस अस फोर बेसिक एडवांटेजेस फर्स्ट यू डोंट नीड द इनिशियल सीडिंग मनी because green field projects are very difficult to produce second it has a stable technology which has been, which is being produced and therefore they already have a supply chain and last but not the least is the risk is lower so you already have a supply chain which is being supplied to and it can be across the world india can invest in a fab industry outside india also and therefore it can save money it can make sure that the technology is relevant it can have a proper supply chain and at the end of the day the risk is lower and the article says that the best thing we can do is this because we can then offset the cost whatever money we, money we save there we can then push it into the research and development for developing a new age plant either within that same plant or as a example or using that model somewhere in india so what basically the article is pointing out is that we need to learn from china china did this china acquired a lot of loss producing fabrication companies and then have produced this major super power visa vis semiconductors and therefore india can also go down the same path itself so there are three basic aspects which have been discussed in this article i'll now slowly but surely move towards the nitty gritty the first aspect was logic memory analog three types of chips thereafter the risk which are involved investment volume and costs and how do we offset it what should be india's path india's path should be first acquire something get a know how understanding have a proper supply chain use the money saved into research and development and then produce your own fabrication greenfield greenfield means new projects full seeding money new brownfield means that it is it has already some infrastructure greenfield means from the scratch itself and therefore the way it argues is acquiring i am not saying this is the only way this is not the argument you will give also but this is an alternative concept which the article gives you this is why we read the hindu newspaper this is why we read these articles because they give us solutions to things which exist so are these three basic aspects clear if they are then we'll move to the nitty gritty the smaller points which have been made this is the base this is the way we will go about it understanding the concept itself then into the details perfect very good okay so semiconductor fabrication in india is important india is susceptible to a lot of issues because it does not produce its own chips and therefore it can be coerced vis a vis what we call as chip manufacturing or chip availability which is there chip shortage is there across the world specifically in india also but because we import semiconductors mostly from south south korea or china therefore there is a lot of accessibility to the fact that we can be coerced to either reduce our demand or give more money itself and therefore india has taken a very important step vis a vis the 2022 semiconductors mission however we need to understand how did things fail previously and how can we learn from it now as i said there are three types of boards which can be produced logic processor logic board memory and analog equipment and its functionalities needs a logic board and therefore it is of strategic important importance and has the highest profit also so logic board is strategically also important highest profit also but expensive on the other hand analog and memory chips are less strategic value cheaper to produce and no margin itself and therefore logic fabs are most expensive while analogs are the least but the aspect here is very simple logic is the only way you can become a super power or a hub for semiconductor manufacturing assembly training makes no sense we have to go for fabrication and therefore logic memory analog logic is the one which india has chosen and is the most important with regards to that now have we previously tried to harness this potential of semiconductors yes we have 
and this is the historical aspect of this whole story wherein in 2007 we had a SIP which is called a special incentive package in which we were trying to bring in collaborators into India to produce semiconductors in India itself to set up what are called fab industries or fab units itself but there was no response thereafter in 2012 we changed the SIP we made it more lucrative more incentives were there and here there was a very positive development wherein two consortia or consortiums did come up and it was believed that this was a breaking point for India when it comes to semiconductor manufacturing. These two were basically collaborations Jay Prakash Associates plus IBM and an Israeli company called the Tower Jazz. On the other hand you have the other one which is Hindustan Semiconductors Manufacturing plus ST my, micro, Microelectronics. However these two consortia though very very enthusiastic and they were ready to push in close to 10 billion dollars and India was ready to give them 5 billion dollars as subsidy also as certain incentives. Nothing really happened because the resources needed were not mobilized. So it's not that we've not done it previously. In 2007 also we tried, in 2012 we also tried, 2007 no response itself, 2012 we did have responses. We had two industries or two collaborations which were set up. However, nothing really materialized because of the level of investment needed and the environment which was needed to produce it also. So therefore, we have tried it, did not work. So greenfield projects which is from scratch itself did not work close to 10 years back. Now, what was the reason for that? What was the roadblock? The roadblock is that semiconductor manufacturing is the riskiest business possible. Billions of dollars before the technology becomes obsolete needs a lot of volume so it so has to make it economically viable and you have to meet it through global demand cannot be producing for only domestic markets further the ecosystem for chip manufacturing needs a lot of things you need the chip manufacturing chemicals you need people to be trained you need abundant clean water and therefore even with the best equipment if poor quality chips come out it will not work itself and therefore it is already given that greenfield projects in India will not work because of the fact that the level of investment can go up till 50 billion, 60 billion as of right now. So therefore, therefore, India has chosen a path to go through the logic way. However, India needs to learn from China in this, wherein rather than developing its own logic fabs, we should acquire existing fabrications, units or fab units, advantages, reasonably priced because they are loss producing, stabilized technology, supply chain ecosystem is already there and already there is a production line and they know their market. India can also then train the people to produce these semiconductors but we can also push the money saved into R&D and this is the basic point of this article. So let's revise what we've done in this article. Three very basic points. Three types of boards, logic, memory, analog. First thing, thereafter, risk, thereafter risky because it can become obsolete, it needs to have very good volume and last but not the least, it has a lot of cost which needs to be covered. Further, India has been pushing for it, 2007, 2012 did not work. Last but not the least is how do we do it? Through the acquiring route. Three basic points, is it clear? Is this article clear? Then we will move on to the second one. Very straightforward. There are two, three solutions which have been given. I have given you a mains question in the end also, so you can practice that also. But you have to bring in these points in different aspects when you write a mains answer. Very good. Perfect. Now, the second one is equally interesting because it talks about two governmental bodies pushing each other. Now, let's try to understand the coal India and the CCI issue. So, Coal India is a PSU, public sector undertaking, though government of India used to by 2012-2013 used to have 67% stake in Coal India, but now has disinvested quite a lot. So, the share is quite lower, but it is still a PSU in that regard. Public sector undertaking, uh, reminiscent of a mixed economy, that period of socialistic development in India itself. And you have the Competition Commission of India and 
the competition act produced it wherein monopolistic behavior or any behavior which distorts the market or is detrimental for the consumer is what the cci goes after so cci has been very very ardently opposing what google has been doing what amazon has been doing and a lot of different cases with regards to google versus cci have also been discussed and are there in the news itself so cci is a very important body that way because it checks monopolistic behavior and market distorting behavior which google does in the marketplace it does it in the google app space it does it in the phones it does it and we've seen that CCI has been arguing for opening up and that is why now Android phones are coming with the option of removing even the basic Google apps which were which could not be uninstalled and that is all CCI's work itself. Now when we talk about CCI, CCI had recently gone after and since 2017 there's a subjudice judice issue with regards to Coal India and Coal India what is the basic argument here again I'm giving you the basic overview of the whole aspect of this article wherein Coal India actually was supplying poor quality coal at a higher price to the DISCOM. The DISCOM means the electricity producing companies itself. So there is, this is Competition Commission of India, CCI. So they were poor quality coal, higher prices and sending it to the electricity producing discoms and therefore the discoms were getting very bad quality what is called non-coking coal and they were producing electricity out of it and because the prices were higher that was pushed to the consumer. Now this was taken up by CCI in 2017 that Coal India has been doing what is called unfair trade practices, very opaque supply and output and even basic contractual demands are very opaque, nothing was written down. The discoms were able to actually prove that they were giving us very bad quality coal, they had no other option because they were mandated to take it from Coal India itself and the prices were also not lower, it was very substandard coal but still the prices were higher. Now CCI took this issue to court and in the, the appellate authority which is the appellate tribunal of the CCI actually said that yes Coal India has been doing non-market based or what are called non-fair trade practices itself. Now Coal India then moved to the Supreme Court saying that you can't say that to a PSU and two basic demands were or basic arguments were made by Coal India. First that it works under the concept of common good. So the principle of common good applies to it. It also is supplying an essential commodity. And the most important thing which it argued was that when Coal India was nationalized, it was nationalized as a monopoly. So very simply, it argued that it was produced as a monopoly itself. And therefore, as a monopoly, we can do whatever we want. And it was something problematic. We are not trying to save Coal India here. It was problematic because Coal India was deliberately doing this. And the justification is we are doing it for the common good. It's an essential commodity. We have to divert good coal to the more important sectors itself. And we are a monopoly. So therefore you can't talk about competition with us. And because we are loss producing, we are not in the commercial zone itself. It makes no sense. Now the Competition Commission of India now argued against this and that is why this article is very important because it gives you a very good back and forth. The CCI thereafter quotes the Raghavan Committee which was established in 2020 which argue, argued that PSUs cannot work under this basic fold that they are doing common good and be inefficient. So therefore loss producing PSUs and PSUs which are actually inefficient are detrimental to the nation rather than being good for the nation itself. And thereafter CCI further argued that essential commodity concept has been debunked. It is, does not exist now with the planning commission gone itself. It makes no sense. And the most interesting point it made was that 
the nationalization act which was previously in the ninth schedule it is not also now in the ninth schedule itself or it is in the purview after 1973 wherein you can challenge the nationalization act also which was used to nationalize coal india itself so the supreme court just yesterday two days back what it did the day before yesterday it argued that there is no merit in what coal india is arguing and it has to come under the purview of Competition Commission of India. And therefore, Coal India has lost its argument and the concept of competitive neutrality has been established. Wherein, be it a private or a public sector, everybody has to be competitive and non-fair trade practices cannot be practiced. So, I'll try to give you the basic gist in a very small line itself and you'll understand everything and then we'll move to the integrity. Coal India has been supplying bad coal at higher prices. Competition Commission said, not correct. Thereafter, Coal India said, very simply, essential commodity, we are the only supplier. We were created as a monopoly. Competition Commission challenged this. Three basic arguments. First, an inefficient PSU is bad for the nation. Second, you are not producing essential commodity because the concept of essential commodity is gone. Third, the aspect of nationalization, which was previously outside the purview of the judiciary, is now under the purview of the judiciary also. And more than that, the bigger argument given by the CCI is that if you are giving them at higher price, poor quality coal, the discoms are not going to keep it to themselves. They will transfer it to the people. So therefore, the people of India are also suffering because of your poor quality and very bad trade practices. Make sense? 50%, 60%, then we'll add the basic data and we'll move on. Public sector undertaking, PSU, yes. Did this make sense? Perfect. Okay. So, let's try to add the basic details. Now, I'm going to the integrity of the article. So, you have the Coal Commission of India or the Coal India Limited itself. On June 15th, the Supreme Court held that there was no merit in the Coal India argument that that it was outside the purview of the competition act itself on the other hand the court has in a way pushed the same argument which had been given by the competition appellate tribunals order which said that coal india was abusing its power and therefore what is the core issue here since march of 2017 itself the competition commission of india imposed a penalty of 591 crores on the CIL, which is Coal India itself, for what? Unfair discriminatory conditions in fuel supply agreement, which is the agreement between the DISCOM and the Coal India, for producing, no, uh, for supplying non-coking coal. Now, what does this mean? Supplying lower quality of essential resources at higher prices and placing opaque conditions on supply parameters and quality. Therefore, the regulator contended that Coal India and its subsidiaries were operating independent to market forces and on the other hand, were basically dominating the market for non-coking coal in India. And therefore, there is a need to challenge this, therefore this penalty. This penalty was challenged by Coal India. Coal India's argument was very straightforward. That we operate under the concept of common good and therefore equitable distribution is needed and discounts will get this type of coal itself. Further, it said that it was secured and created as a monopoly under the Nationalization Act of 1973 itself, the Coal Mines Nationalization Act of 1973 which is used to make Coal India a national subsidiary, a PSU itself. And therefore, PSUs as it is, Coal India did not operate in the commercial sphere. And Coal India said that we are loss producing. We have 9,000 crores of loss in most of our mines itself. And therefore, we should not be under the purview of the Competition Commission because our principle of movement, our principle of operation, our principle within the market itself is separately created and it's different. However, the CCI, the arguments are quite interesting. The CCI very straightforward. First, the Raghavan Committee 2020, it was made for specifically the perusal of the respondents itself, observed, and this is very important for you, because this can be, the Raghavan committee can be quoted in any answer now. And please note the lines of this committee. State monopolies 
वर नॉट कंड्यूसिव फॉर द बेस्ट इंटरेस्ट ऑफ द नेशन दे कुड नॉट बी अलाउड टू ऑपरेट इन ए स्टेट ऑफ इनएफिशियंसी एंड शुड इंस्टेड ऑपरेट एंड अमिट कॉम्पिटिशन देर फॉर इट स्ट्रेट फॉरवर्ड से दैट पी एस यूज आर नॉट इम्यून टू एंड शुड नॉट बी इम्यून टू कॉम्पिटिशन एंड देर फोर दे शुड नॉट बी outside the concept of competition commission of india and they have to work for the nation for that you need to be efficient you can't be a psu which has been producing loss after loss after loss and you're saying that you're doing common good no that is not good for the nation itself thereafter it also said that the consider essential commodity had already been removed since 2007 itself and the nationalization act was also removed from the night schedule in 2017 therefore because the coal india is supplying 80% of all its coal to the power companies and these power companies thereafter transfer this cost to consumers at the end of the day the indian public the public is paying for this unfair trade practice and therefore it means that cci should have purview over coal india and this irregular price and supply has a significant impact on the final consumer now the supreme court very simply has said yes there is no merit to the argument given by coal india itself and therefore it should be under the competition act and why is this important for you because now there's a new word which has been introduced for you which is called competitive neutrality competitive neutrality has been established wherein no company is outside the competition act itself therefore be it public or private everybody is the same so now let me again consolidate this whole article for you very simple straight forward first there's a tussle between cci and coal india coal india says essential commodity we were created as a monopoly therefore we should be outside the purview of market and therefore competition cci said ragavan committee says you are useless if you don't produce for the nation and you're not efficient further the final cost is been pushed to the people itself and at the end of the day your nationalization act does not come under nine schedule and over and above that it is also not that you are producing an essential commodity since 2007 therefore therefore the argument does not stand and the supreme court has also asserted it now what do you remember out of this out of this you remember competitive neutrality ragavan commission or committee and the concept of competition act not not previously not applied to psus but now will be applied to psus this creates precedence clear everybody the second article again gives you a lot of interesting aspects related to how governance how competition how psus how mixed economy comes and clashes in a certain area ragavan committee specifically established to check the viability of psus in this modern world itself and therefore that was the basic judgment given by it. okay see why is it not an essential commodity because coal is now being seen as, as not a green source of fuel and therefore the we there's a coal tax also so coal is now not incentivized in that regard okay now the next is a very interesting thing which we all do every day and related to upi now the Uni the united payments interface the the upi we all use every day we have either paytm we have either phone pay we have google pay we use upi quite a lot now upi was created in a context of demonetization but what this data tells you and what this article tells you very interesting understanding of that is that there are certain paradoxes and there are certain problems which have now come in front of us so it's about value it's about volume and it's about how much transactions we can do so the first thing which this article talks about is that there's a lot of different regulations which are being applied to upi as of right now when it comes to daily limit when it comes to value and volume and therefore it is increasingly becoming a problem for the banks to process this now the first point which it says is that for example the national payments corporation of india which is npci which produced upi has put in a daily transaction limit of 20 meaning 20 transactions you can do of upi in a day and the whole value should not be more than 1 lakh per day so in a day you can do 20 transactions 
and the total value of all these 20 transactions should be one less than one lakh in that regard. However, there are certain banks which give you less limit, there are certain banks which give you more limit and more than that, there is no standardization when it comes to transaction. But that is actually not the problem. The problem is not just the transactions, it's not just the limits that can be sorted very quickly, it's rather the data which is coming out. Now, understand one thing, whatever I'm discussing here, this data is irrelevant to you except for the conclusions. There are two conclusions which will come out, but in order to understand that conclusion, you need to understand the data. So for GS paper 3, generally it is important, but try to understand the data with me, but you don't have to learn each and everything. What you have to learn, I'll tell you. First things first is the number of transactions since 2016, 4,000% increase, close to 5,000% increase, wherein between April 2016 and May 2023, in April of May of 2018, if we take it as a midpoint here, there were close to 190 million transactions which used to happen through UPI. However, today that has increased to 9,000 million transactions which happen, which is an increase of close to 5,000%, 4,855% to be precise. This is a very big number, very, very big number. 5,000 increase. So between 2018 to 2023, from 190 million to 9,000 million transactions. That's a very big jump and a lot of transactions are happening through UPI. We all know that. However, what is more interesting is, if we look at the different instruments which are used to pay different payments, the share of UPI has reached close to 73%, wherein when it started the major, major was either NEFT or you had IMPS or you had debit card, credit card. This was standard and NEFT used to be more or less the most preferred transaction when it came to big amounts. And the credit card and debit card played a very important role in settling transactions. This is, remember, volume. This is volume percentage. Meaning if 100 transactions are happening, how much percentage goes to each one of them? Now here there has been an exponential increase in UPI. UPI started with 6%, then reached 36%, then 51%, then 73%. So 73% of all transactions which happen today are happening through UPI, which is a very big number. However, however, the paradox is not this. Before I go into what is written, the paradox is if you go by the volume, the value should also be big. If 73% of all transactions are happening through UPI, then when it comes to the total amount transferred through these, the num, the value of UPI should also be high. But that is not the case actually. Though the volume is 73%, when it comes to the value of transaction, it is only 21% of the value. This means, very simply, we are doing UPI for 1 rupee, 5 rupee, 10 rupee, petty transactions. And we do it. You now don't keep cash in your pocket, rather you use Google Pay or Phone Pay or Paytm to get any small or big thing. So you have to, you have to buy a toffee, two, 2 rupees, 10 rupees, 50 rupees, 100 rupees, small transactions are happening. Therefore the volume is quite high, but the value is very, very less. And though the value of NEFT has gone down quite low, the, the, rather the volume of NEFT has gone quite low, the value is quite big. So 51% of all value is still in NEFT. However, the volume is very, very less. This is called the paradox of UPI. The paradox of UPI is we are using it quite a lot, but we are not using it for big transactions. We're using it for small, 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 small transactions. Don't have to keep 10 rupees in your pocket. 
the point is NEFT IMPS needs a mobile app that's a proper bank to bank transfer IMPS is immediate NEFT can take close to 24 hours but at least two to three hours it will take so for big transactions we still trust the bank to bank transfer however small transactions giving it to an auto rickshaw driver giving it to a rickshaw wala everywhere we are using UPI so the problem now which India has as of right now and the banks have is that the volume is high the value is less and the biggest issue is this can only lead to two things first the the value volume needs to come together and second the way the volume is increasing the failure rate is also increasing so therefore UPI is also struggling in that regard so First things first, 5,000% increase in the number of transactions. Anybody has a problem here? 5,000% increase in the number of transactions. Any issue here? No. Okay. Now, the next point is volume. Uh, is volume. Volume is how much transaction. Now, let me read it out to you. It will make more sense. Chart 2, which is this, tells you various instruments in volume of the retail payment in India over time. In 2017-18, the share of UPI in all retail payments was only 5.9%, while prepaid payment instruments such as Paytm, Amazon gift vouchers and wallets were still there and debit cards had a major share close to 20%. However, this is the more telling story. In 2022-23, UPI instrument the share increased to over 73% while prepaid instruments have come down to 6.5%. We don't use debit cards now. We mostly use D UPI, which is true. Also, the share of credit card in retail payments has decreased from 11% to 2.5%, which is good. Credit card is technically a loan. Now, the same simple point, try to understand this, is 73% from 5.9%. This is a very big increase. In if 100 transactions are happening, 100 transactions are happening, then 73% of 73 transactions are happening in UPI. Anybody has any issue here? That wherein, if 100 transactions are happening, 73 transactions are UPI, others are less. No. Okay, very good. Now comes the paradoxical part. The paradoxical part is, however, the surge in transactions has not been translated into value. The value of UPI in 2018 was 33,000 crores, which is one transaction was close to per transaction was 1,756 rupees. Now in 2023, it is 14 lakh crore. However, if you bring it down according to the volume, it comes to 1,500 rupees per transaction. So therefore, transaction wise, we have gone down 175 rupees so previously if per capita if you want to say per transaction it was 1700 now it is 1500 only and this is the paradox volume is increasing but value is decreasing and therefore the problem is that the biggest value is still with NEFT with bank transactions so before we move on to the two basic conclusions which you will have to learn just to give you a basic understanding the phone pay is basically dominating when it comes to the uh, chosen chosen platform phone pay then google pay and then paytm and sbi obviously has the biggest volume when it comes to upi so that obviously is going to be there sbi the biggest bank in india now this is what you learn please pay attention here this is what you learn for the examination this is where your insight is going to come through that Two basic conclusions which are coming through. First, surge in volume and decline in value leads to, this gives us the first conclusion, consumers are increasingly using UPI as an alternative to petty cash. The transaction value is smaller and smaller over time. Second, however, because the volume has been increasing, the surge in UPI payments by upgrade by the, the people has not been matched by the banking sector or banks upgrading its infrastructure. And therefore, 
they are struggling to meet the UPI demand. So there are more failures also. And therefore, there is also why smaller banks are setting UPI transaction limits so that they can manage the volume itself. So first is transaction failures. Second is too much volume, petty cash. So before we move on to the prelims bite section, I'll give you a summary of the first three articles we've discussed. The first was the concept of semiconductors and semiconductor fabrication. Logic, memory, analog. Memory and analog the easiest to make but no margin. Logic the hardest to make but a lot of margin. Risks, volume needs to be high. There has to be technology which is relevant not obsolete and there is an issue of obsolete technology by the time you are able to develop your infrastructure and the costs. Solution, acquire rather than greenfield first. Second, we discussed Competition Commission of India versus Coal India. Coal India arguing nationalized monopoly and common good. CCI saying no, you need to be in the competitive market, unfair trade practices and therefore the Raghavan committee along with the different arguments given by CCI have been upheld by the Supreme Court. This is equally interesting wherein the biggest problem, see, there is a problem and there's a paradox. Paradox means it's a dilemma or it's basically a contradictory situation. The problem is the volume is increasing. Daily transaction limits are not, are not set. On the other hand, the paradox is though the volume is increasing, the value is decreasing. And when the value is decreasing, the fact of the matter is that the banks are struggling to meet the demand. And if they are struggling to meet the demand, more failure in transactions. And therefore, this becomes in itself a chaotic situation, wherein the problem and the paradox are related to each other. Volume is increasing, daily transaction limits are not the same in every bank, but even if the volume, if the volume or the transaction are kept to 10 or 20, the aspect here is value is decreasing. So from 1700 per, per transaction, we've come to close to 1500 per transaction, which is not a good thing. And at the end of the day, the aspect related to NEFT and IMPS is decreasing, but the value is quite high, 51%. So I hope you understand these three basic articles. Then we will go into the prelims white section. Small, straightforward, I'll tell you what to remember there. Yes? Very good. Now, first, as I said, prelims white section, factual understanding you have to learn and no depth is needed. First is India's first mRNA vaccine against Omicron has been approved. So previously itself, up the Pune-based Genova Biopharmaceuticals had got an approval for the Genmo, GenCovac 19. This is a mRNA vaccine for COVID-19, but they've also now got a specific mRNA vaccine for what is called GenCovac Om, which is Omicron. For specifically Omicron, we have now a specific vaccine itself, which is encouraging. And what we know is that it can be stored at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius, which means that it can be transported and can be pushed into India itself. And it is commercially viable also. And it will be rolled out in the next 2 to 3 weeks. Simple point is what you have to remember is this. These two names just remember and the name of the pharmaceutical company. 1, 2, 3, nothing more, nothing less. Because vaccines have been in the news quite a lot, previously questions have also come. So we don't expect a question on what type of vaccine, the inactivated mRNA, that is not important. What is more important to us is the new word, which is Gem Kovac Om Gem Kovac 19. This is a very straightforward article. This is the only thing I need to discuss with you. Thereafter, the second article is equally important for you. But here again, only one simple thing I am revising with you. First things first, China has been doing it quite a lot. China, the all-weather fled friend of Pakistan. If Pakistan has struggled over and has been struggling over FATF regulations, though it is out of FATF now. But the aspect of different terrorists being designated as global terrorists. So China on Tuesday blocked India and the US proposal to designate a lashkar e taiba terrorist, Sajid Mir. He is basically involved in 26-11 attacks on Mumbai. 
and what you have to remember is this and this is already part of static what they used to designate a person as a global terrorist is UN Security Council Resolution or Committee 1267. This is what you have to remember. 1267 Al-Qaeda Sanctions Committee of the UN Security Council is what designates different people or different, different persons as global terrorists and that freezes their money travel ban is there and arms embargo is also there. Now, we don't need to be very surprised that China is doing it. China is doing it because Sajid Mir is related to Pakistan. Pakistan argues that Sajid Mir is dead, but basically there is no real, no real evidence for that. Now, the point is, this is all part of static. Why are we discussing it? Because now this 1267 comes in the news and they'll ask you a very straightforward question. 1267 UN, UNSC resolution is related to what? And you just have to remember it is the global terrorist concept which comes out of 1267. Very straightforward, simple. Last but not the least, as today is International Yoga Day or International Day for Yoga, yo the first thing which you have to remember is what is the theme for today. It is Yoga for Vasudeva Kutumbakam, which is the world is one community as it is uh, the Prime Minister is in the US. This is a very important concept of the Indian diaspora getting connected and India being connected throughout the world through its culture, soft power. So this is the theme for International Day of Yoga today. Second is TriFed, which is the Tribal Cooperative Marketing Development Federation of India has also used this moment because mats are used for yoga. So they are pushing close to 34,000 yoga mats which were produced by tribal artisans so as to regularize and popularize the concept of yoga and using tribal made or tribal mats rather than the styrofoam or the plastic mats which we use. So herein again two very straightforward things. First, TriFed pushing through through the International Day of, of for Yoga or International Yoga Day, the concept of tribal mats and second, the basic theme for today. Tomorrow's newspaper is going to be equally important tomorrow day after because the more news we get to know from America, the more it will become relevant for current affairs. But before we end this session and move to the main question, six articles we've done, semiconductors, the concept of very simple semiconductors, risk, logic, memory, analog, acquire. Thereafter, we did the concept of CCI versus Coal India, Raghavan Committee, the aspect of competitive neutrality. Third, we did paradox and problem, too high volume, too less value, and the problems of failure in transactions. Then Vasudev Kutumbukam, thereafter the 121267, and last but not the least, simple concept which we discussed was Omicron Genkovac Om. Is this clear? If all of this is clear, we'll look at the mains question and we can end the session. Yes? Okay. So, mains question, practice it do. Uh, India's semiconductors policy and strategy needs to be revamped. Comment, standard question, but a very relevant question. The recent UPI data reveals a problem and a paradox. Discuss the above statement in the context of recent study on fin financial transactions in India. Smaller question, 150 words. But again, this is your GS paper 3. This is also GS paper 3. Very relevant questions vis-a-vis -vis mains. So I hope you will practice them also. So with this, I would like to end the session. Thank you so much. I will see you on Saturday again. Tomorrow, Chetan sir will be there with another set of issues. Take care. Bye-bye.